And that means I wait 30 seconds, correct? Correct. Okay. While you're waiting, let me ask Suzanne a quick question. So I sent you an email about inviting Bill Ross to the closed session. So can you do that, please? Absolutely, I will do that. Okay, thank you. Bill, Bill Ross and David Schwartz are two of them, but uh, only Bill is going to attend, I think. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right, we are live when you're ready to go at 6 p.m. Okay, well, oh, it is still 5.59. All right, I have 6 p.m. Uh, I'd like to call this study session to order and ask for roll call. Suzanne, can we have roll call? You're on mute, Suzanne. Rebecca Armendaris? Here. Beyond Bracco? Here. Zach Hilton? Here. Peter Lerone Munoz? Present. Carol Marks? Here. Fred Tovar. Here. Ray Blankley. Here. All right. All council members are participating remotely pursuant to the governor's executive order number N2920 in order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The meeting is being live streamed from the city website, cityofgilroy.org, and is viewable on cable channel 17 and on Facebook Live. Public comments can be made during the meeting by watching the meeting online and calling 669-900-6833 or logging into Zoom at https colon forward slash forward slash rb dot gy forward slash dtc960 and enter passcode 339994. When I call for public comment, press star nine on your telephone keypad or use the raise your hand icon. This is a study session and uh, it's regarding City Council Vision 2030, mission goals and work plan for fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Jimmy, are you giving the report? Yes, I am, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, tonight is a follow-up from your previous uh, strategic planning workshop uh, where you, you spent a Saturday going through a, a lot of the, uh, the items that we asked you to review. And so tonight we're going to do a second review. Uh, we're going to go over uh, some of the input that we received from you. And this is your chance to talk to the department. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you going here in the first part of it, but then it's really going to be, a, I think, a council and department conversation because I want you to be able to ask the questions that you want of the departments that um, have the work plans uh, before you. Uh, we'll do a little bit of recap of Vision uh, 2020 and mission and goals, and, uh, and then we'll spend the bulk of time on the actual work plans. Uh, again, you, you do not have to make any decisions tonight. We'll continue to take your feedback. Uh, we, won't, we won't ask you to adopt work plans until you adopt a budget, and we'll ask you to adopt that at the same time. But the purpose of tonight is to start aligning those work plans with your goals and vision, and then when we ultimately present you the budget, we would, we would expect that they would all align. So uh, that being said, I, we do have a, a PowerPoint, and I'll, be your, I'll get you through the beginning, and then I'll switch it over to the departments who will be giving their presentation and then you can direct your questions uh, right to them and uh, we'll just uh, move along in that way. So, okay, you should be able to see my screen. So can you see the, okay, good. That always makes me a little nervous. Okay, so the goals for this evening is to finalize the vision for 2030 and those revisions that we talked about and then uh, finalize the, the fiscal year 22 and 23 goals. And those were two items that you gave uh, very specific language and clear direction on what you would like to see some adjustments. So I'm looking tonight for some consensus. Uh, there's no formal action, but uh, I know some of you had very uh, distinct language you wanted included. And we, uh, we did everything we could to try to get it in there. And now we want you to have another look at it and let us know if we, we've got it right. Um, then we'll continue to work on the fiscal year 22-23 policy and program list. I kind of call that your legislative ca calendar, uh, where you've listed a lot of the policies and, and, and things you want us to bring back to you during the course of the next two fiscal years. 
And then uh, lastly, we'll continue to work on the fiscal year 22 and 23 departmental work plan. That's that's where the work actually gets done. So um, this is the third step that you've taken. You had the mid-year financial update that we did back in, uh, I believe, early February, and then your strategic planning workshop. And then tonight is your strategic planning study session. Uh, as I do with every, every discussion of our our, uh, our workload and our, our objectives, uh, I always remind you of the five-year five year forecast and that it's at, at what we're proposing in our work plan is involved with the, these projections, which includes uh, still utilizing $2.8 million in reserves in the upcoming fiscal year and returning the, the city to a sustainable um, operating margin in fiscal year 22. This is exactly the same chart you've seen since January. So I, I'll let you know if I switch it up on you, but this, this should not surprise anyone. And always just a, a quick reminder, uh, this is what our picture looks like. So I'll dive right into Vision 2030 and the consensus of the, the seven uh, or the group was that they didn't want a, a very significant re, um, you know, recreation of the Vision 2030. Uh, you did ask me to send out the specifics on what does that mean? And I did do a little bit of research and we were able to find them uh, from about six years ago. So hopefully that helped a little bit. And I'll show those to you in just a second without going through them all. But one thing that was pointed out that was uh, requested to change is in red here. And it's our accessible recreational and opportunities and recreation destination. After all the council's been through in the last year talking about making council a recreation destination, uh, felt it was appropriate to include that. So uh, I'll pause there and see if there's any feedback from council, if there's consensus that that is appropriate or you want further modifications, but this, is, this was the only change uh, to the Vision 2030. I don't, I see a, a, some thumbs up. Okay. Okay. So let's just keep moving. That's the, that's the one I figured you would be pretty, uh, you know, we, that was the only change we had. So that, that's fine. Okay. So next um, let's go to our goals. Oh, I'm sorry. The, I'm not going to go through these principles. I I've sent them to you. They're in your packet. Uh, we can talk about these more at some point, but I, I don't want us to get too much in, into that because these were, again, we said we wouldn't change our vision too much because the language really, it really is consistent uh, throughout. And uh, much of what you have in here would be things that you would recreate anyway. So uh, there's nine principles and I'll just click through them. And, and anybody who's watching the video or anything at home can pause it at some point if they wanna see all of them. And it's also on the city's uh, website now as well, so. Jimmy, if I may, Mayor. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm having some issues, technical issues here. Can we go back to the last slide? Sorry, one more. We talked about um, we're talking about our thriving downtown, which I, I think we all agree on that. But if you go back one more slide, sorry, I was trying to chime in before. Sorry, one more. There you go. Um, for the vision 20, 2030, um, yes, our, our thriving downtown. But I, I and again, I think we all agree that we want it to be all our businesses, you know, throughout Gilroy. Um, you know, yes, downtown is very, very important because it's it's the heartbeat of our uh, of our city. But I also want to make sure that we don't exclude. And I know we're not, but I just want to make sure that we're we're mentioning that. You know, again, our downtown is the heart of our community, but also all the other businesses. You know, on Santa Teresa, on First Street, on Tenth Street, wherever it may be. I just want to make sure that um, we're letting everyone know that that's important to us as well. Mr. Tavari, would you, would you like to offer up a, a, a slight modification to, to make sure you're covered there? It, yeah, no, I, um, again, even if we, you know, we do a, another bullet point, you know, where it's, you know, our, you know, making sure that we're, you know, we're supportive of all our local businesses, you know, uh, something that includes, again, I think, because I think we all agree, we want to, you know, we're all doing our best to help all our businesses. I want to make sure that that's included in our vision that um, our goal is to make sure that all our local businesses are, are thriving and uh, are being supportive. Okay. Uh, okay. Ms. Armendariz has yeah, her hand thanks, up. Thanks, Jimmy. Yes. Okay. I was just going to, I was just going to suggest if we just add our, add, if we say our thriving businesses and downtown. Yeah. I think uh, that would it'd be an easy fix. Yeah. Thank you. Good, good job. 
I think that uh, that looks uh, suitable for everybody. So, okay, thank you. I am going to retire my role as a facilitator here shortly, Mayor. You can you can, okay. get, you can get the hand raising. I I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> Okay, so again, Vision 2020. Okay, so we talked a little bit about our goals in fiscal year 20 and 21, and we did spend a good amount of time on this because uh, the group felt there was too many and they weren't specific enough. So uh, rewatch the video, rewatch some of the things. I know Council Member Tovar had crafted words, so we got that in there, and we also know that uh, other council members had things they wanted to address, so uh, we redrafted them. And so um, there's five of them now, and they're a little bit longer, and they're a little more specific. But we listened to every piece of feedback that council had. And so I'll go through these quickly, and you'll know the points where you, you wanted them addressed. And uh, please let us know if we got it or if we want to continue to talk about some of these. Uh, the first one was, uh, it was ensure financial stability. And the amendment to that is develop a financially resilient organization that relies on local revenues and resources. Uh, the term financially resilient is kind of the new buzzword in government finance. And so I thought that would be appropriate to put that in there. And then we also wanted to address the fact that we are not waiting for anybody else to come save us uh, financially. So if that one is okay to the group, I'll move on to the next. Um, Mr. Tovar, okay. Okay, then the next goal, uh, again, wanted to get a little more specific. Uh, we had. Uh, we had a few here where we combined because we said enhance, um, you know, public safety capabilities and streets and that. But uh, the consensus from the group was let's get a little more specific. So maintain and improve city infrastructure, including streets, facilities, and incorporates green energy where possible. Okay. Okay. Uh, this one is Mr. Tovar. Uh, I, I, I hang on, Jimmy. Hang on. Uh, Councilmember Armendaris has a question. Yes, go ahead. Say uh, green energy and practices. Sure. Any, everybody okay with that? Fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Mr. Tovar, this is yours. I, I watched it a few times to make sure I got the language right. Promote economic development activities that create opportunities for quality employment and increase the city's tax base. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. You're welcome. Okay, so the last two, ensure neighborhoods benefit equally from city services, including public safety, streets, parks, and recreation. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Ms. Armadares? Yeah, I am um, thinking about our discussion over streets and how, um, you know, the worst ones will be addressed last because we want to maintain um, the, uh, the ones that aren't as bad, right? And have, remember that discussion about um, street maintenance. I'm wondering um, if the language says ensure that equitable resources are distributed. And there is a difference between equality and equitable, right? And so I want to make sure that um, that the distribution of our resources, our city resources, are distributed equitably versus equally because some are going to cost more to get to the same place that others are. Does that make sense? It does, but I don't think I can craft it as well as you said it. So can you can you give me a little bit of help say, here? Um, sure. Ensure city resources are distributed equitably. Um, ensure public safety streets, parks, and recreation resources are distributed equitably among our neighborhoods. Does that work? I, I guess, I mean, to me, ensure neighborhoods benefit equally is saying it, but if that's 
not what makes you comfortable. I mean, to me, this problem is getting fixed because we are finally putting some money towards our streets. This mm -hmm. problem is be because of the policies that have been going on for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, siphoning money elsewhere. So yeah. um, it's just but like, me, uh, but the way I see it, it's like if, if one neighborhood costs 20 bucks to get to the same place where another neighborhood costs 10 bucks, right? Then that's, that's equitable distribution versus equal because equal would mean they all get 10 bucks and do with it what you can, right? But equitable means they'll both get to the same place. That's-, that's Mr. Mr. Medeiros, can I, can I offer up a suggestion? Yeah. Um, ensure neighborhoods receive equity from city services, including public safety, streets, parks, and recreation. That yeah. Yeah, that, that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, good. I, I expected that to be kind of easy for us because we spent so much time on it. And uh, so we'll next time we'll come back and we'll just take a look at that one more time. Say anybody have any any other thoughts or whatever. But now we'll move on to the next section. Wait, and, you didn't um, do the last one, Jimmy. Oh, my goodness. OK. Ensure availability of safe, affordable housing for all Gilroy residents. Jimmy, can you give some background as to the discussion that we had on that? I'm, I'm trying to remember how we got to that language, because obviously, as people know, the city's not in the business of building housing. Um, so I, I just want to kind of rem remind myself as to what we had that led to that suggestion. Well, the discussion was, uh, you know, we did spend a lot of time talking about housing. And so I will tell you of the five that I kind of modified, this is the one I struggled with the most because you are right, um, we don't build housing, but we do have programs. So uh, maybe, you know, there's some language here that might address that at how we facilitate, how we are better. And when we get into the, um, you know, the legislative part, you'll actually see language that you could point right to that goal. So maybe I missed a little bit on that one. So I'd be very open to, to craft that a little, little better. So maybe something along the lines of ensure city promotion of available, safe and affordable housing for all Gilroy residents? Yeah, I was wondering if you meant, how about just change the word ensure to promote? Yeah, uh, that, uh, no. yeah, I, I think that, that could work, that could work. I mean, it is more accurate. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that the language itself does not suggest that the city is ultimately responsible for building for yes. building the housing. I mean, we Agreed. know that, but I just want to make sure the language reflects that. Agreed. I, I see a hand up by Council Member Hilton. Yeah, I, I would just go back to what Jimmy said, too, is that there's plenty of policies and programs that are going to be in play for the next two years that promote this, including the arena allocation, where we're going to have to really do some deep diving and provide affordable housing. So we zone for it. We set the policies for it. We don't build for it, but we are required in the next two years to get a really good dialed in arena. So I think it's important to at least leave that affordable housing component in there. Oh yeah. And, and uh, council member Hilton, I, I agree with you. I, I'm just merely suggesting the actual language that we're using there that we include promotion uh, just so people understand that, that that is the role, the proper role of the city is that we're trying to promote the availability of that housing. I would agree with that. I think the word should be promote availability. I think from a legal standpoint, if I may, that would be preferable because ensure is a little too strong for what the city is obligated to do or can do for that matter. So right. promote the availability? Is that right. right, promote availability of safe, affordable housing for all Gilroy residents. Because we can't ensure and we can't provide could we we can absolutely promote. I mean, promote, promote, advocate. Is advocate a stronger word to use there? I mean, again, I understand we can't ensure, um, but if we advocate, I mean, promote's great. Um, again, I, I, I like that, but I think if we if we use a stronger, you know, word in in regards, you know, to what we're trying to do here, and I think advocate, fight, whatever it may be, to to. to Again, to make sure that we're doing all that we can to um, bring as much affordable housing to, to Gilroy. Councilmember Tovar, I think that promote encapsulates all of all of that, the advocacy and everything else. That okay. that's my uh, my take on the yeah. word promote there. That, that, then that, that's that works for me. All right. 
Okay, lots of thumbs up. Good. Okay, well, thank you for that. Let's go ahead and dive right into your uh, council policy uh, and programs. And this is where I, I'm going to need some more input because I, I actually told you during the, the uh, workshop, please don't get in the weeds. Did a very good job of not doing that. Now I'm going to ask you to get in the weeds a little bit because um, your staff is going to be working on these. This is, we're committing to uh, 16 legislative items or programs for you uh, to work on. Um, we're not asking council right now to even talk about the merits, but we want to know kind of the areas that you're looking at. And so an example would be, um, here, let me change the slide. In the first one, this was uh, from uh, council member Aaron Darris about in lieu fees versus allocations. And so the responsible apartment for that is the community development department. And so I, I want, if there's any uncertainty from the department or from the council member, I just want a little further discussion so we can hone in on that, that policy a little more and make sure we're covering what you're you're looking at. So um, I'll, I'll ask you, Ms. Armendariz, and I know Karen Garner's here to help as well, so. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to see um, staff come back with is, um, information about what other cities do to get uh, funding uh, for special programs like homeless services and other things, libraries, recreation, what have you. Um, and we can jump into the weeds on that later, but what other cities do and charge for, um, for residential and commercial. So like linkage fees, inclusionary housing ordinances, um, some charge a, um, a flat fee per square foot, others charge a, um, others ask for a certain number of, a percentage of um, the development to be uh, a certain level of housing, affordable, low income, et cetera. And some have a hybrid model of those. And so I'd just like to see what, um, what works for the cities around us that have a same population and, um, you know, um, geography and all those in our in our um, county right that have similar economies so i just like to um because it's going to be a, a hard decision right to figure out what works best because yeah if we get a dollar amount from fees then it's not going to go as far tomorrow as it will today right um, or do we ask them to build units um which can be also um challenging because sometimes cities uh, can pull money or other organizations can can do something better with that kind of money. It can go further um, in terms of building units. So, so I'd like to see uh, what the best practices are in other cities and, um, and include a hybrid model. Council member Hilton. Thank you. Um, another one too, since we're sort of staying up high with the in lieu fees is that I know some of these in lieu fees for community development, if we're talking about like off street vehicle parking, whether it's in residential or commercial in our code right now, it says that you can, there is an in lieu fee. If you don't want to basically put the parking in, there's an in lieu fee, but we can't um, apply for that, charge that because there's no current nexus study. So I would, as long as the group feels it, I would I would encourage us that if we are going to get into in lieu fees that we make sure that we and we get those in the code that we make sure that we follow those up with nexus studies so that we can actually charge and we're not in the position now where um so where those fees would not apply because we don't have a current nexus study thank you thank you okay I Karen, do you have any questions or I, I think that was really helpful. That was a lot, a lot deeper than we did the first time. So. No, that was right on. I agree 100% with council member Armandaras that uh, if we're going to look at, you know, fees for affordable housing, you know, we need to look at all the options and figure out what's best for Gilroy. So I appreciate that comment and council member Hilton yours as well about, you know, if we want to do in lieu fee for offsite parking in our downtown, we need to take those next steps and uh, make that happen. Okay, we'll go to the next one, which is renter protection policies. Um, you do have a uh, moratorium coming up on your upcoming agenda item, but this was a, uh, from council member Armendaris as well. And this would be more uh, directed to me. So that I have the solicitor under administration. So I would just ask you if you could please elaborate a little more on, on what you're looking for and what we can do to help. Sure. So um, 
homelessness can be uh, prevented, right? Um, and that's one of the keys to, to helping end it. And uh, when we see communities have strong renter protection policies like um, just cause evictions, like rent stabilization policies, um, then we see um, folks stay in their homes longer, they get assistance, they avoid eviction, they avoid homelessness. And so I'd like to see um, how, those, how we can make those work in Gilroy and if it's something the, the rest of the council is interested in, because I know the, the community is definitely, definitely interested. Okay, that's very helpful, very helpful. So Jimmy, are you looking for consensus here on these things? No, no, no actually okay. I no. Um, Thank you, I got kicked out of the meeting, my, my internet, and so I missed um, the beginning of this. So. No, this is this is really our attempt of staff to kind of organize your legislative work. So we we in some instances we can bundle them together, or we can know when the timing is best to bring them forward, and we're committing to doing that. And so no, I, yeah, this will just be the 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 direction to give us to bring it back to you, and at which point you can build your consensus or not. Okay, Jimmy, question, um, and obviously I, I agree with Councilwoman Armendariz in regards to her suggestion. But I'm, and again, I don't know if this is um, similar to sort of the requests I made almost a year ago regarding, you know, renters protection, the moratoriums and all that. So I'm not sure which direction we're going with this. I mean, I think it's very, very important. I think she laid it out perfectly. I just want to make sure I understand what sort of your thought behind what, what the recommendation is. I think these are, are they're very similar, but I also think they're distinct in that the object, the items we talked about a year ago at council and we're going to talk about again in April is a moratorium on evictions. So it is a form of renter protection, but it's not a formal rental protection program or options or what have you. It just basically says that we're not going to evict uh, before X number of days or whatever. So they are related, but they are different. Right. Now, Jimmy, does that um, also protect um, you know, business owners as well that are leasing their businesses, you know, where again, as you know, COVID has really done a number for many of our local businesses and several are struggling to continue to pay sort of their monthly, you know, their leases. Do we, will this sort of correlate over to, or, you know, uh, to, to that as well, meaning that, you know, when we talked about this, renters, but also, I mean, you know, you have business owners who are renting as well. Is this going to protect them as well? Because I think it's important that we include that in there. Um, because again, I, I think we all agree that we don't want to see any of our businesses close due to sort of everything that's happened. And I think if we can make sure that we're, they, we incorporate them into this language as well, it'd be important. The language I, I I'm proposing, uh, council member, yeah, is, is included in that. Is commercial uh, renters are included. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm, I, we're not trying, I think this is just sh showing us what is going to be coming up, right, Jimmy? Things mm -hmm. we're going to be coming for discussion because I'm sure there are a lot of comments on the specific item, but this isn't the time to do that. That's why I was asking if you're looking for consensus because I want to make sure the public, no one from the public is construing this to sound like we're entertaining rent control, for example. That's a, you know, that's a very particular thing. And if that's something that... Um, the council is, is going to be, I, I don't want this line item in tonight's study session to be construed by anyone as the city going to rent control because most pe most cities will put that on the ballot. That's, that's something the public has to because as council member Armadera said, yes, there's a portion of the community that wants something like that, but there's also a big portion that does not. And so that is, that is not, there are two sides to that. So I just wanna make sure that we're not getting ahead of ourselves, that we understand and the public what it is, this is what we're doing tonight. Okay. Sure, we can, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, we can move to the next one, which I think it probably doesn't need much direction at all. We'll bring back to you a five-year street, street repair program uh, based on some feedback we got from you concerning funding. So if there's no additional comments on that, we can we can move along. Um, we also received uh, about downtown Rule 20 undergrounding. Um, that was from uh, Mayor Blankley and Council Member Bracco about bringing that back to council about how we're spending our Rule 20 monies, 
what's our philosophy, what's our program, and what's the money that we have at our disposal. So unless there's any other feedback on that, that was pretty clear to us as well. Uh, grant writing, I, I don't think I need any more feedback on this one. Uh, I've gotten it in a lot of forms and I'll certainly incorporate something in the budget recommendations to address it, but I, I, I was very clear about what we're looking for. And, and also the other thing that I need to do a little bit better of is letting you know when we receive grants. Uh, we, we're not the best salesman in that sense, and I think you would like that information. So that, that was pretty clear. Uh, downtown specific plan. Uh, that was from council member marks and community development and that was the request to do an update um you will see this on the work plan coming up and it, we can talk about that a little bit more if you'd like to but that is reflected um parking management from council member hilton um that might be one where we could use a little more uh quick discussion and just to get some information for staff to know that we're we're meeting what you're you're looking for sure thank you sure. Um, so I'm thinking of the future, basically starting with parking management in downtown Gilroy. Um, that's where we're going to be attracting, that's where we're going to build a parking lot. Um, that's where it would be a good source to be able to, um, you know, collect, collect parking. Um, I believe it's called like a variable rate parking system, um, where, you know, where you would pay based on time of day and uh, weekend. Um, so this would be enforced by, you know, parking management. Um, and I think that it would be good to have it not only just be at scale in downtown, but also to include the major corridors, which is um, probably between 10th and 1st um, on Monterey Road, and then including 1st Street, you know, all the way back up. Um, most, of the, most of the time, these departments can fund themselves, um, uh, not only with staff, but also with sidewalk cleaning um, and, uh, you know, even being able to put money back into programs to upkeep the parking uh, lots or, or any of those that we have in downtown, not, not just including the new one, but, um, you know, repaving and striping of the old ones as well. Um, that's really what I'd be looking at. And I, I've mentioned it before too, you know, that locals, locals know where to go to park for free. Um, we always do. It's the tourists that, that we're going to be capturing mainly on this. And if for any of you that have ever traveled anywhere else, if you want to be front, front and center, um, you know, and you want to pay it, pay the price, then you're going to do it. Um, so that's generally what I, and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions, but that's generally what I'm trying to get at. And it keeps those turnover for those restaurants too. Um, you know, they rely on turnover that if you talk to any restaurants here, they're talking about table, table time. Right. Um, and this would not get, this would get the residents and the business owners to not, um, take those front prime spots as well. Thank you. Council member Bracco. Yeah, if, if you drive down 10th or 1st Street, there is no street parking. It's all been taken away. So there's really nothing you can charge for. The only place we got it is downtown after 1st Street. And we've done, we went through this before and our biggest opponent is the downtown. Um, they don't want us enforcing the parking um, we've tried enforcing parking downtown before and it, it was working. It was keeping uh, parking spaces available, but the downtown was against it when people started getting cited. And um, I, 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 I'm, I would like to hear more on it, what Zach's talking about. Because um, we, we've looked at it before and some, some, some of the times we looked at it, it said it would cost more than it was worth. And so I, I would like to hear a real objective opinion on it. All right, Council Member Tovar. Thank you. No, and thank you, Council Member Hilton for that. I mean, I, I agree with you, but I, I do agree with what Council Member Brock was saying. I understand that, you know, it, it, you know paying for parking, for example, would, would help with the turnover in regards to, you know, people coming in. To, but I don't want to, because it's already difficult enough to get folks in Gilroy to go to downtown. You know, is this going to be another uh, obstacle in the way for them to say, well, we have to pay. I'm not going to go downtown. I'm just, I'm just cautious of trying to find the best way to make sure that people do go downtown. But I, I, I like that because, again, it'll help us clean the roads, clean the streets, maybe put lights up, whatever it may, we need to do. I just want to make sure, like Dion said, you know, let's have a extensive discussion on this and make sure that 
whatever direction we go. And if it sets the direction um, and it, it works, it works for me, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about everybody, those folks that may not be willing to go downtown because they have to pay for parking, for example. So um, it's just sort of my take on that. But again, I think after a further discussion, uh, I get a better sense of what, you know, the rest of the council thinks. Council member Armandaris. Thank you. I like the idea of, um, of something like this investing. It's like an investment I see it as, um, and a way, uh, a small step towards changing um, our downtown culture and the kind of folks that we attract. We wanna focus on tourism and stuff, then we behave like a tourist town and that includes paying for parking. And, um, and I like the balance like um, of it being, uh, the cost is according to the time and the location of the parking. Um, you know, I think tourists are used to that. And if it self-generates and pays for itself, I, I like the idea. I see it, like I said, as an investment. Council Member Marks. Mayor, I thought we weren't going to be debating these issues. I thought we were just going to <laughs> clarify. So <laughs> we're going to be here all night. <laughs> I, I, I know I don't I don't when things are this vague it's hard for me to know when to you know tell people this is not what we're supposed to be doing but uh, I think Jimmy needs to get a certain amount of understanding of what what he's what the what he's supposed to do with each of these directions. And I, I don't know how to do that without getting consensus on each item, but you're not asking for consensus so. Uh, Jimmy, I see Councilmember LaRoman Yost has his hand up too. I, I mean, I guess you need to help me help you <laughs> with what it is you yeah. need to get out of this. We're, we're not we're not asking you for permission to bring it back. We're making sure that we're clear on what you would like. And I understand there's pros and cons to everything. And, and tonight's just not the time. That's, that's what we'll work on. Uh, so I know it's hard because you do have thoughts and opinions, but uh, that was kind of an example of where, you know, you're asking us to bring back what we're going to bring back and already analyzing it. So I know it's hard. It is hard. Okay. So, so then what you asked for is what did council member Hilton mean? He answered that. And so should we be moving on then? I would say yes, please. Okay. 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 Uh, Okay, uh, uh, number eight was downtown parklets with council member Armandaris. I, I believe we've referenced other cities, uh, Hollister one uh, being one uh, that has a, has a program. I, I don't, do you have anything to add to that, Ms. Armandaris? Or I, I think it was pretty clear what you were looking for. Yeah. Okay. Um, unhoused community, that was for Ms. Armandaris. And again, we're gonna have a whole, we're gonna have work plan items on housing and homelessness and, and the unhoused and all that. So um, I think we're okay there. Uh, climate action be benchmarks. This was one where uh, staff was a, would, would like a little more uh, clarification on uh, what quite you're looking for, uh, Ms. Armandaris. That was mine too. Um, I, um, gosh, there's a lot. Councilmember Armand Dice, um, can I jump in for a second? Sure, thank you. I, I thought I thought this was around us looking at opportunities to explore some of the the more clean energy um, capabilities for some of our our infrastructure. I think this is what it falls under. So you know, solar things like that. I I could have sworn that's what you were talking about when we had this conversation before. For, um, for our public buildings or for developments? I thought it was for public buildings. Okay. I thought, I, that's what I thought, but it was a month ago, so. Yeah, yeah. Is that, okay. can we start Jimmy, with- Does that, that make sense in that context? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, if we could start there, that would be great. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, reach codes was something council had considered before. Council member Hilton was uh, requesting that it be brought back again. You know, I'll, I'll elaborate briefly on it. You know, since I sit on the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board and we are a member of them, um, they have an entire group that is willing to come down and um, talk about the benefits of this. Um, that's something that they were not given the opportunity to, to before. Um, and um, I sat through about an hour talk with them on it. Um, it's not something that I feel like I want to be the one to convince you all whether you should do this or not. 
but do I think you should give them the opportunity and do they already have staff and expertise that have been doing this and they know what works and what doesn't work in other cities? Um, I think it would benefit us um, to have them come down and do that and whether that's in a study session or you, you, know, you let staff um, you know, speak with them ahead of time um, and, uh, and get that done. But this is the direction that, um, that the state is going. This is the direction that the county is going. All SBCE members um, uh, have gone this direction. So I think it's, some, it's, it's worth debating that I'd like to see us not just uh, not consider. Mayor, Council Member Tovar. Yeah, um, so let me make sure, because again, I, prior to Council Member Hilton, I was on that, that board and I, I believe we had this, um, the executive director um, come and present to, to the council about a year ago. We so, did. Yeah. And, and we I absolutely did. did. Yeah, right. so what, what Council Member Hilton meant is they haven't presented since he and Council Member Armandaris have been on the council. Oh, got it. Well, got it. and yeah. I, I, what I meant was more than that. Garish is their CEO. Garish right. is not in charge of reach codes. There are professionals in that organization that are that are ready and that are dialed to do that. That'd be like Jimmy giving a presentation on a development. <laughs> There's professionals that that do that. So it's not just because me and Rebecca were not on the council then. We had a presentation. The, the council, not this council considered that and we looked at it quite deeply and had reasons against it but we're not supposed to be giving those reasons right now jimmy just needs to be to understand what is meant by things correct okay okay uh just a few more here uh, uh economic incentives job protection that was miss armandera's again <laughs> yeah so um we have economic sense. So job protection, there's uh, language in and policies that other cities have in, um, in our county and throughout the state that help workers. Uh, for instance, during this time of pandemic, a lot of folks were laid off. We are heavy on service industry. Um, and there's policies like um, a worker retention policy. So it says, you know, if you're laid off, um, not fired, but laid off, um, then you would be the first in line to get rehired. Or if a contractor changes, like a janitorial contractor in the city changes from one to another, then that contractor would retain you for 90 days. Um, so it helps people um, retain their jobs if they're not if they're laid off for no fault of their own. Um, and so that kind of stuff is is an incentive. Uh, for people to work here. It's also a way for jobs to be protected uh, when there's things like a pandemic or a recession um, and things start looking better. Um, and it helps uh, employers um, keep good workers. So those are the kind of policies I'd like us to look into. Okay. That, that's helpful. Okay. Uh, next was public safety mental health response team. Um, that's going to be a discussion from uh, Chief Espinosa a little bit later. So if you have any questions, he, he'd be much better to give that information to, but I think we were pretty clear on that. Uh, access to technology, uh, including uh, addressing the digital divide. Uh, that was uh, Council Member Laura Munoz and uh, Council Member Tovar. Any, anything you want to add to that? I think we, were, we, we have good direction there as well. No, I'm good. Okay. Okay, and the last two were safe parking policy and RV towing policy, and I, I think that's uh, just to bring the policy back and to have a discussion about it. So I don't, I don't know they need much from there unless you have something you'd like to add. Okay. Well, that that concludes the council policy programs agenda, and so that's really the part where I'm going to step aside and I'm going to uh, facilitate uh, just the slideshow at this point. Our, our department heads and division heads will present to you their work plans. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out before we, we get into this is we've talked a lot about the, um, the concept of mandated, core, and discretionary. And we've even included that those definitions in your staff report, but manda mandated is those required by law. Uh, we have no choice to provide them. And uh, a lot many times we receive no um, funding for that. And that comes from the state or the federal government. 
And then other activities are core and discretionary core supports mandated activities. You don't have to do it, but it is part of your community and, uh, and generally uh, borderline mandated, I'll say. And then um, discretionary is things we don't have to do at all. And so um, it's not that we advise not doing it. I'll give you an example. Um, we, we have a discretion to have a recreation program. Uh, we never advocate not having one, but it, it's not required by law to do. It's just part of what makes your, your town a community. So I'm um, not arguing the merits or what have you, but I will tell you as the department heads go through their presentations, you will see that the mandated ones are, are, are going to take up some of our time and including the core and then uh, the discretionary are a little harder to fit in. In your packet, as I described, there's a list of all the work plan items that, that, that the staff would love to get to. And in some departments, it's just not possible. And so we had that line of delineation uh, in the staff reports that just said, this is where we feel is the most we can get done. And, and so as you, uh, one of the reasons why we're not having you make decisions, because if you, you want more time to talk about some of the things we say we're not gonna be able to do, I will tell you that if you're gonna want to add something, we're gonna have to remove something. And so that, that's part of the conversation uh, going forward. But tonight is a good opportunity for all of you to get some questions answered about the work plans, about what this entails, and just get some clarity about what we're gonna propose. This will uh, be adopted again when you actually adopt the budget. And after tonight, it'll be a lot easier for our staff to align our budgets to, to where the work plan lines up. And that's why we need to have this conversation with you. So first off is uh, our community development director, Karen Garner. She just has a few slides to go through and I'll, uh, I'll get her started. Go ahead, Karen. Great. Good evening, mayor and council members. Karen Garner with the community development department. So uh, before you is uh, first of several bullets of what is on our work plan for the next couple of years. And I think probably most of these you're familiar with. So I'm gonna read them quickly, but please, if anybody doesn't understand what something is uh, or needs more explanation, just let me know. So at the top of our list, uh, something that we are mandated to do is update our general plan housing element. It's actually due in 2023 but uh, we have to get working on that now. There's a lot of steps involved to get to that point. Uh, the next item is to uh, publish our annual general plan and housing element report, which you just saw that, but that's something we do need to do every year that is mandated. Third item is implementing our land management system, our LMS, and we've been working on that for a while. That's scheduled to be uh, implemented at the end of this year. And then of course, it'll probably take us a couple months to really get fully functional on that and get used to it. And then also get our customers uh, used to using this new program. But we're very excited about that. We think that's gonna save us a lot of time and, and just be a huge step in customer service. Uh, after that is update zoning code and zoning map. And that's of course, uh, with the adoption of our general plan. That's sort of the next big step after that to make sure our zoning code and zoning map is in alignment with our general plan. And then adopt objective design criteria. We've had a lot of discussion about that. And so we will definitely be working on that over the course of the next year. And then complete development fee updates. This is something that we had looked at all of our fees that we charge uh, and we're getting ready to update those just prior to COVID. Uh, so we kind of took a step back and wanted to see the effects of that. What we've seen is that it really hasn't slowed development down. So we really need to get back on that and adopt those fees so that we're uh, getting uh, fees that are in line with the services and the, the staff time that is being provided. All right, next slide. Then here's our uh, inclusionary housing, affordable housing in lieu fee. So all those things that council member Armendariz talked about earlier, um, you know, there's different ways to, to do this, but you know, with the ultimate goal of providing more affordable housing. Um, and then of course, in line with some of the, the RENA numbers that we'll, we have currently and we'll have a new cycle. So we definitely want to do all those things council Armendariz talked about as far as looking at best practices and then uh, reaching out to our community and deciding what is best for Gilroy. Uh, right along with that is implementation of the new arena cycle, which kind of goes hand in hand with our, our housing element as far as timing goes. And there's just a lot of steps and things we need to prepare for, pay attention to as we're getting ready to 
uh, wrap up our current RENA cycle and start the next one. Next on the list is integrate our GIS with the LMS and increase our GIS-based services. Uh, this is something that uh, we're excited to have a position that devotes half their time to GIS. And uh, it, this, some of the things that they can do with GIS are really nice um, and really increase our customer service again. Then downtown specific plan is next. And, and we do, we have applied for a grant that will uh, help us get a really big start on the downtown specific plan. Um, without that grant, that is something that probably will fall off of the list because it is an expensive project and specific plans do cost a lot of money. There's some things we can do, even if we don't get that grant, there's some outreach and data gathering and information, you know, going out to our downtown business association and businesses and starting to do some gathering, but um, it would be difficult to really uh, dedicate a lot of staff time to that, given everything else on our plate. So that's one of the things we, with a grant, we would look to partner with a consultant to help us with that. Uh, the next item is to develop a traffic level of service to vehicle miles traveled policy. And that is just one of those things we need to do. The way that they measure uh, traffic uh, used to be called level of service that's changing. So we need to update our policies to be reflective of that. That also is uh, grant dependent and we have applied for a grant. We should find out on all of these grants, I think in April uh, next month here, uh, if we are going to receive any of these grants. Next slide. Karen, I'd like to point out right here for the public, for people watching, I know council members know that everything you've addressed so far, all of these bullets are either mandatory or core. We haven't touched on anything that's discretionary so far. So that's important, I think, for the public to realize as they're, as they're going through these. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Yes. So the next one is to develop a traffic demand management policy. That's also one we've applied for a grant for. And uh, actually, one of my staff just let me know that we'll actually find out. It's actually May or June when we'll find out about these grants, but still pretty soon that we'll, we'll have that information. Um, that's another one that uh, is core and, and something that we need to uh, update. Uh, after that, we have implement customer bill of rights and customer service initiatives. Council just heard a presentation by Julie Weirich on that. And so this is discretionary, but we feel it's very, very important. Um, it's something we've talked about a long time of really increasing our customer service. Uh, the next couple of ones uh, probably seem a little out of place. Uh, revise ag mitigation policy and revise mobile vending permit uh, ordinance. But the reason those are on there is they're, they're old uh, policies and ordinances that we continually stumble over. They come up and our, our customers have a hard time understanding them. And an example, ag mitigation policy was based on a map that was done like in the mid 90s. <laughs> And so we just, we really stumble over this and need to clean it up, need to update that. And the mobile vending permit ordinance is actually the state, this is a situation where the state passed uh, new laws that uh, invalidated a big portion of our mobile vending permit. And so we have a hard time enforcing some of those things. We need to update that and get it in line with state requirements. And then, uh, the other one is CDBG and housing trust fund policy uh, discussion and recommendations. And really this is just taking a high level view. We've kind of been doing uh, the funding and the grant process the same way for many years now. And I have heard from various council members and members of the public, they'd really like us to sort of take a holistic view of these funding sources and maybe rethink the way that we use them um, you know, probably a good time to just remind everybody what all the options are and see if council wants to make any changes on that. Uh, and then uh, last on the list are the reach codes. And, um, you know, if it is bringing back what we did, I think it was November 2019 when that went to council, bringing that back and having someone come in and do a presentation, that's a pretty quick and easy thing that we can do and bring back to council in the next couple of years. 
Um, so with that, those are the items that were on the to-do list. And in the packet, I know there were some other items that sort of fell you know, below the line, so to speak, of things we, we uh, have on our mind, but just don't have the staffing or resources to accomplish. But I do want to point out, as I mentioned, there are some items that are grant dependent. And so if we don't receive some or all of those grants, it probably will free up a little room. So sort of the next item on the list was to develop and re or revise um, our permanent parklet and outdoor dining policies. We have temporary ones in place. Um, so if we don't get grant funding for something, it probably will free up enough time for us to address that in the next couple of years. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. If anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. I see a question from Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Karen, for that wrap up. So um, are you saying that the, the parklet policy or permanent parklet outdoor dining policies might not be able to get dealt with? Is that what? Correct. Currently, if we were to get the grant funding for those three items that I talked about, it, that's going to keep us busy uh, and probably would not have time to create permanent parklet and outdoor dining policies. We have temporary ones in place. We can continue to go with those. Um, and actually there are some permanent policies in place for um, outdoor dining. It, we, we'd like to address them and probably simplify them a little bit, but they, they, we do have some in place. Thank you. That was my biggest concern is that that's totally fine if staff can't get to that, but to keep the outdoor, to keep what's happening and not uh, reverse it, I think would be the best direction. <laughs> Some people have been able to double their capacity. Um, you know, it looks like there's life out there on the streets. Um, and I, I, I know that it's not uniform. I know it's something that a, a policy could adopt, but to simply make everybody go back inside, um, I, I would not be supportive of it. So it's good to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, I will for sure be coming back with the temporary policies that we put in place because those are set to expire at the end of May. And at that time, council will have the ability to give feedback, whether, hey, you know, continue on um, or if they want to do something differently. So thank you. Okay, I can't see everybody. So does anyone else have their hand raised? Okay, moving on then, Jimmy. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, next up uh, for you is Public Works with uh, Acting Director Gary Heap. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, so I've got a handful of items we wanted to present this evening as well in terms of our work plan for this next upcoming year. It starts with everybody's favorite project, the development of our five-year streets repair program. Uh, and this is something we're working on right now. In fact, Neuron's uh, very hotly working on coming up with a list so that we can present this to you over the next several months using that $3.9 million amount uh, that we're going to be looking to find. Uh, so we can then bring back the streets of uh, the list of streets, not only identified through Street Saver, but also some of our failed streets and how we're going to plan on building those out over the next couple of years as well. Uh, the second item on that list is the implementation of our CityWorks CMMS program at the courtyard. CMMS is a computer maintenance management system or basically a work order system. Right now, uh, we don't have the ability to really track a lot of the work electronically. This is going to help us become more efficient and uh, get with the you know, current digital age, if you will, or tech technologically, uh, technological age that we need to get to to be able to really function uh, as, a, as a good department uh, with our yard. Uh, install new backup generator at City Hall. That's the title of the project that was in the CIP. What we're actually doing is connecting uh, the existing backup generator at the police department that has adequate capacity in case of emergency to, to go ahead and, and uh, power up not only the, the police station, but also City Hall. So that project is moving forward and will be completed later on this calendar year. Uh, replacement of steel water service lines. Uh, that was also in the CIP. What we have a plan to do there is to work on this continuously for the next several years, uh, do about 50 a year, 25 with our crews, and then some of the more difficult ones that we've identified uh, knock out about 25 per year with our own engineering staff and putting those out through the design build uh, bid process. Seventh and Eagleberry parking lot construction. Uh, we're from, all familiar with that project. That's moving forward. Uh, upgrade residential fire hydrants. Uh, we're planning on doing uh, about 12 per year with our own city crews. Uh, and so that's on the work plan for this next several years. 
uh, especially this next year. And then conduct a park tree assessment, uh, really get a good handle on the trees, be able to put that into a GIS for tracking in our CMMS program. And then lastly, development of a downtown parking management plan, uh, looking at what the actual parking is down there, what the needs are, how to fund that. Uh, that could also include the Nexus study to allow for the city to charge for that downtown park in Luffy that we've just heard about uh, or were asked about. So these are the items that are high priority items for our public works department for the next year. There are several other things we're working on, but these are the things that we wanted to present to you this evening. The next slides. No. Um, uh, Gary, before you go, uh, if I may, Mayor, if I may. Yeah, I see. Right. I see Councilmember Tobar's hand, and then I also see Councilmember Hilton and Councilmember LaRomanos. Yeah, thank probably. you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, going back to sort of, yeah, I mean, thank you for this layout here. But in regards to the 7th Street parking uh, construction and also, also the development of downtown parking, I mean, mm -hmm. I think those sort of kind of correlate with each other. But um, one of the things that I and I think several of us advocated for is that we looked at all our available parking, uh, you know, areas in downtown, and um, again, making sure that they're um, that we put some investment in those that we made sure they're safe, they're lighted, whatever it may be, you know, with security, whatever it may be. Because again, going back to what Councilmember Hilton said, I mean, you know, we want people downtown. But the thing that keeps people from going downtown, they, A, they don't think there's any parking, B, they feel that the current parking lots that we have are unsafe. Yeah. And, you know, our city manager knows, I mean, I, I don't need to call them. I'll text them and say, hey, what's going on with this parking lot over here? There's, there's a boat, there's somebody doing work on their cars, you know, and this and that, there's mattresses there. I mean, those are the things that we need to prevent because, again, I mean, first impression says a lot, you know, and if I'm coming from the outside and I say, oh, there's a parking lot back there and I see someone's boat on, you know, um, whatever you call those lifts or whatever that they're working on, those are things that are going to keep people from, from coming downtown. If, if it's dark and there's no lighting and um, I don't care if it's a block away from downtown, people are not going to park there. So I want us to keep that in mind and remember that, you know, when we're investing in any parking that we're, we're not forgetting about the other parking, um, you know, uh, areas that we have and making sure that we keep those safe, clean, lit, and whatever else that we need to do, make sure that uh, people are actually um, going to those areas. One thing that hasn't been mentioned as well, and I think it's important is, we, you know, we did talk about uh, clean energy, but one thing that we should really consider again is um, charging stations. You know, those will get people cars downtown, you know, if they know there's charging stations in parking lots that aren't being utilized, maybe that's where we start to install these um, charging stations. Whatever we can do to get people to say, you know what, that's where I need to go. Um, and again, I just wanna make sure that we keep all that in mind when we're having this further discussion later on. Absolutely, those are all very good points. And you bring up some very good ones. And it's not only the lighting in the parking lots, but the lighting to those parking lots. And exactly. making sure the streets are well lit so we can have people feel comfortable actually in using the, those lots and making sure they're clean and kept up well. Uh, and it's also looking at, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, uh, I believe it was council member Hilton about the parking management strategies in the downtown and right. potentially looking at some variable rate type of options. That's what this parking study will do. It'll look at the parking, it'll determine how it's being best used and then come up with some strategies about how do we encourage the employees to not park on Monterey uh, and the like. So that's uh, that's exactly what we've got in mind for this. Right, so yeah, and then one of the things too, obviously is we, you know, we wanna be responsible Respectful to the residents of these areas out sure. there. But we also have to come down with the hammer if people are leaving their cars there or, you know, whatever they're doing, that we need to find folks say, you know, we're not going to let this happen anymore. Absolutely. You know, this, these are for, you know, this is parking and it's not to be utilized as a storage or a place where people are fixing their cars or leaving them there for 30, 40, 50 days. I mean, we need to make sure um, that, you know, again, if it's public safety or whatever it is that, we're, we're keeping them clean and safe as well. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't know who was first between uh, Peter and Zach. Do you guys know? Go ahead, or Do Peter. you care? I'll, I'll just go real quick. Thanks, Zach. Um, just real quick, Gary, as, as you're considering the, the five-year plans for road maintenance and everything else, I mean, we all know the, the annual you know, $3 million price tag just to maintain pace for where we're at, not necessarily to improve anything, just to maintain the current uh, PCI. Right. Uh, 
In terms of that five-year plan, will you consider potential sources of funding? And as part of those considerations, will you be thinking about potential federal funds that we might get, recognizing that that's still to be determined? Absolutely, those are those are really excellent points. Um, yes, uh, you know when when you look at that that funding amount that we've been asked to work with, which is the three point nine million dollars. One of the things I promised you in that presentation was that in May we would be bringing back a funding plan that would tell you exactly how we're going to get to that three point nine million dollars uh, and be able to then uh, have us all understand staff and council that we're very comfortable then moving forward with the budget to be able to do that. That then allows us to take a little bit longer, design the plan, and then bring that back in maybe July to show you exactly what those streets are over the next couple of years. Keeping the PCI at the three point, I believe it was the 3.6, which would kept the PCI even, the 3.9 got you five point bump. But that was with the street saver option. And what we're finding out is, is we're going with the blended option and again, getting to, sorry, down the rabbit hole, a little detail here, but you asked the question. <laughs> uh, as we're taking some of the, that money away from the street saver option and putting it towards a failed street, a, a Luchessa, a Bolsa, something like that, a Monterey, that then drops the PCI a little bit. And maybe we're going to be holding costs steady at the 3.9, mm -hmm. but fixing a lot of these failed streets on an annual basis. So those, that's the kind of information we want to bring back to you in July on this payment program, as well as setting up for, you know, if there's an influx of money through some kind of a federal uh, yeah. grant or something like that, being able to plug that right into Street Saver and just go. Very good. Well, I'll look forward to getting that. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. All right, Council Member Hilton. Hey, Gary, um, the implementation of the city works, does that technology also trickle down to those workers in the field to be able to access all Absolutely. that information like work orders and stuff like that? So they're not working off log books and stuff anymore? Absolutely. In fact, uh, what's been delaying us just a little bit is, is some of the training around the iPads that the staff and the, and the crews are going to be using. So the work order system will be managed by the managers in the office, and that'll be fed right into the iPads that the guys have in the field that can then track, log the information, um, document things, and, and really keep things uh, well documented as they go through their day of activity. So yes, it will. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, for the public, the only things that are discretionary in this discussion are the, the parking, the parking things that we're talking about and the, the assessment of park trees. So again, to keep in mind that as uh, Jimmy told us, as we move forward, any other things that you want instead, something else is gonna have to come off and that something else will have to be something that's discretionary. So, okay, moving on. Okay. And we get into the next slide. So now here's all the fun stuff we're doing. Here's unfortunately all the fun stuff we're not doing because of the lack of resources or the lack of funding. Um, these are all projects of these next two slides that were identified in the CIP uh, as, as projects that are, that are uh, of interest to the city or, and, and staff um, based on master plans, based on a, a number of different things as we talked about when we developed that CIP. These are all un, unfunded projects and, and a lot of these are key. So the, key, the, the point here is I wanna make sure you guys have these on your radar as we're getting into the budget cycle here in the next several months uh, to understand that uh, these projects are still out there but these are unfunded projects. Um, and I don't know if I necessarily wanna go through these item by item here, but um, if you see any of these specifically that you want more information about, I'd be happy to answer those questions. And that's all I've got for public works. Okay, I, I see two hands raised at this point. I'll go with Councilmember Armendaris because possibly Councilmember Tovar didn't lower his hand. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering about uh, City Hall security upgrades. Um, uh, is there like what's the need for them, and what are we looking at? City Hall upgrades. Uh, th that's a facilities project, uh, if I remember right. That was uh, to upgrade the locks around the city hall, the perimeter doors to a key fob type of entry system. And then as well as uh, updating a lot of the internal locks and security systems from a number punch to a key fob type of system. Okay, so it's more of an update than it's more uh, of an there's update. not a, a greater need for, for security. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. But it's something that a lot of other cities are doing right now and we're kind mm -hmm. of, the technology we have is a little bit old fashioned. All right, council member Tovar. No, uh, Councilwoman Armadar has asked my question, so um, oh. thank you. You always say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, moving on. 
I don't know if I should be asking uh, if, if there's any public comment yet, or do we want to get all the way through this before I, I go to that? Uh, Jimmy, do you have an idea of how much longer before I can? Uh... You know, we uh, we agendized it to be after. Uh, you could do okay. it now. I think we're, we're about in the middle of the work plan, so it, it's up to you, Mayor. Okay, Susanna, is there anybody waiting to ask a question? Uh, it looks like we do have one hand raised. Okay, why don't we, I hope I'm not opening something. Let's let's try that because we're an hour into this and in case somebody has a question on something we've already discussed, it might be easier than going through the whole thing. All right, All right go ahead. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone now or raise your hand. Uh, the person with the hand raised is Jan Bernstein Chargin. I'm hitting allow to talk now. You may uh, unmute yourself now. Hi, um, I actually did uh, accidentally raised my hand, so I don't have a whole lot to say, just that I'm glad that uh, council is going to be looking at housing and homelessness issues. As we know, there was a sweep at the um, Caltrans did come and clean up the encampment over at the 10th Street on ramp this morning. I also got a call. I got a call from the shopping center across the street because only six people were left this morning, but they, of course, moved their stuff right across the street to the shopping center. So. Um, this is because we didn't have a place to tell them where to go. So I'm still uh, excited to be working with anybody in the city who can help us identify a place where we can direct people so we can help them get housing. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. All right, let's continue. Mayor, sorry, before we, uh, can what? I ask a quick question? Well, is it per pertinent to what we're trying to discuss here? Because what, what that question was is not what we're do discussing here. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, all right. Did I, okay. I'll, I'll pass. Right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, our next department is uh, police. The uh, Chief Espinosa. Madam Mayor, Council, good evening. Uh, Pedro Espinosa, Chief of Police for the City of Gilroy. Um, we've been ramping up to implement some of these legislative mandates and really forecast for some future ones. And aside from the work plan items that are mandated, we really crafted them carefully to be able to model and really take a philosophical approach to those pillars recommended by the report of 21st century policing. And so in 2015, the state passed uh, AB 953, what is, what is known as the uh, uh, Racial Identity and Profiling Act of 2015. And our agency falls under the fourth wave, which is those agencies that employ one to 333 officers. And so beginning on January 1st, 2022, we are going to have to start compiling this data and present it to the Department of Justice no later than uh, April 1st, 2023 and or before. And so as we look for a vendor for our new software uh, to improve our, our records management system, that is one of the requirements that uh, we are proposing that it's able to draft some and draw from that uh, data. <clears throat> Equally important is um, our whole goal to be as transparent as we possibly can with the community. And um, the Department of Justice incorporated implicit bias training procedural justice into a new program called Principal Policing. And so as it stands, we have six of our internal uh, 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 folks that are lined up to get the train to trainer uh, class. And so that in turn, they can come back and start uh, training the rest of our staff. The Commission of Peace Officer sta uh, uh, Standards and Training uh, required that uh, implicit bias training uh, happen every five years as a perishable skill type, type training. And I could uh, uh, foresee that training becoming mandated every two years. So this training will, will put us ahead of, of, of the uh, curb here. So hopefully we're able to get that uh, in, in no issues with, we've had a, a pretty difficult time finding those classes because of COVID, but now start, as, as things start to open up, uh, that has make it, made it a little easier. Increased trust building efforts between the community and, and the police department. We've, we've really uh, been working hard to be um, 
every piece of communication, we've been trying to do it in both languages. And so even the town hall meetings that we've held, uh, we duplicated those town hall meetings and really been responsive to the Spanish speaking community. And that is something that we want to continue doing. Another mandate is that our uh, folks receive de-escalation training. And as soon as those classes became available, we were able to get the majority of our staff trained in December. And so as we onboard new officers, that is a priority to, for us to send into that training. And this training has a uh, crisis intervention component to it as well. Uh, we also have about 15 of our folks that have We've gone to the 40 hour class, which is an extended crisis intervention training uh, course. And again, because of uh, COVID, the mental health, behavior, mental health and behavioral health staff uh, were redirected and they haven't been able to hold a class. So hopefully, as that opens up, we will continue to send our folks to that as well. Next slide, please. And again, in order for us to be able to deliver a good service model, we have to keep a uh, healthy and resilient workforce. Our folks have been nonstop for the last two years uh, and really didn't, didn't have a uh, ample chance to reel from the garlic festival shooting. Uh, we uh, led right into COVID and we've been asking a lot from them. And it's important for us to do whatever we possibly can to make sure that they're healthy. And so that is something that we're lining up as well. And we have a scheduled training in uh, September that we're gonna be hosting here. And our peer support team really has been taking lead on this and, and hopefully there are uh, uh, available to them to be able to pick up on some red flags and, and again, keep them healthy. So in turn, we're able to, to provide the best customer service that we possibly can. Conduct an internal department survey uh, focus groups led by our supervisors. We are currently working with a consultant and we have six of our supervisors that are leading focus groups and really doing an internal assessment as how we're doing one as an organization and two as uh, command staff and we received a grant from the state uh, to be able to uh, the same consultant facilitated team building workshop at, and what we hope to accomplish there is one take these surveys and uh, build on whatever uh, internally we could, any changes that we can make, but also uh, develop our strategic plan for the next three years. And what we wanna do is uh, parallel that strategic plan with council's plan um, and ultimately be able to take that information and ask the community how we're doing. So we also wanna conduct a community survey. And so before we do that, we wanna make sure that internally uh, we're in a place in a position where we're able to take that feedback and again, uh, make whatever changes that we possibly can to build up that trust. One of the programs that we found very successful was our Community Police Academy. And we've held those both in English and Spanish and we also had a bilingual academy. And the first Spanish uh, class that we held eventually morphed into the San uh, Isidro Nueva Vida group that's been doing a tremendous tremendous work over on the east side. And so uh, we wanna reimagine the way we do these engagement programs because of the current restrictions. So if we have to do a hybrid, if we have to do virtually, if we have to do it via YouTube channel, that is something that we wanna be able to have as an option and consider. We've been we've partnered with the district attorney's office and uh, the South County agencies, the school district, the Morgan Hill Police Department and the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office and uh, broach the topic of juvenile delinquency and, and to make sure that we're doing whatever possibly we can to keep first time offenders out of the juvenile uh, justice system. And so uh, there is a South County Youth Diversion Program that is being currently uh, spearheaded by the District Attorney's Office and the South County uh, Youth Task Force that is, is really gaining momentum and we're hoping to implement something that is going to take the philosophy of uh, restorative justice, and hopefully we could get something done uh, by the end of the summer. So we're an active participant in that, and we're excited about that. And hopefully we get these kids that uh, offend a second chance and be able to um, uh, remedy those actions via restorative justice circle philosophy and, and go from there. 
Next slide, please. When we start to onboard our new supervisors, we want to have something in place so that we keep the continuum of supervision and development. And so we've assigned one of our uh, newly promoted sergeants to develop a program that she's currently working uh, with our field operations captain. And they started gathering uh, models from other organizations that we hope to be able to uh, implement here something uh, for us so that it's in place and that we keep that conti uh, continuum of supervision and development for newly onboarded sergeants. Again, part of the team building workshop is for us to identify uh, our three-year strategic plan and parallel that parallel with uh, council strategic goals. And so that we are going the same direction and we have something in, in place and that we are striving for. What are the uh, work plan items that is not up here and that we uh, uh, broach is the whole mental health uh, response here in Gilroy in the South County. And it really behavioral health has been pushing, uh, doing a real good job to try to get services down here to South County. They currently have a mobile crisis response team that we've, we've called a couple of times on a few occasions and they've been really responsive. You know, certainly they are not available 24 seven and, um, and, and really, uh, depending on what clinician is working in the hours, it, it, it determines their, their workload and availability. And But the good thing about that is they're able to make the post-crisis uh, contacts and really offer some of those resources. The city of Morgan Hill is currently modeling a program called the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. And it's a model that started in San Diego with some of the Southern California agencies are employing. And I'm in contact with Chief Kalsko over in Morgan Hill. And we're hoping that as the program develops and they hire the clinicians, uh, they're able to start to service some of the other South County uh, agencies and, and, and give us a hand and really try to figure out if this type of model is something that we can implement here locally. And we, we on a yearly basis, we are, you know, second or third on the uh, commitments that we have uh, with folks in, in mental health or behavioral health crisis. So something like that would be beneficial here for the, to the South County area. And so um, with that, I'll take any questions if, if council has any. Yes, I see council member Armendariz's hand raised. Uh, thank you, Chief Espinosa. A couple questions. The um, training, is the plan um, like the crisis intervention training, de-escalation trainings, and the other ones that you mentioned, is a plan for every officer in the department to get those trainings or a majority? Um, what's the plan for that? The plan is to have every single officer, even, even our... Um, our dispatchers participating in that training in the December. So that's that's the goal. The goal would be to have every uh, single member of the organization, but certainly uh, the field and sworn personnel is a priority, those that are making the current contacts with our community members. Uh, but ultimately optimal would be to have the entire organization uh, participate in that training. Okay, and then I just have one, another question. Um, you just mentioned the uh, mobile crisis response team that the county's behavioral health department has. Um, and then you said something um, about it would be beneficial to have that. Do you mean for our department to have its own, for our city to have its own? Or do you mean, I mean for us to be prioritized in the county? That's certainly optimal. Is it, is it realistic? Um, you know, it's it's the hardest thing is recruiting clinicians that are willing to participate in, in programs like that. Uh, you know, some some are, are not too apt to work in nights and weekends, uh, but certainly there are those that are. And uh, internally, you, we would have to have the staffing to assign. And really, the motto is that one officer gets the, the training. And I think they call it a cross systems training that they do with behavioral health aside from all the crisis intervention training that they have to participate. And uh, Morgan Hill is doing it once a week uh, for now. And again, they're doing the, the post contact and trying to make sure that the continuum of service is there and that they, uh, particularly if they have a client who they've uh, had interactions with on multiple occasions, they're trying to establish the long-term care for them so that they 
uh, limit the amount of, of calls that they have with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Council Member Tobar, you have a hand? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Chief, um, I don't necessarily have a question. I just have a comment. I wanna um, commend you and your staff um, for your continued efforts with the, um, the town hall community meetings that you've had. If you recall, um, you know, when, you know, originally I advocated and pushed for that to happen. You guys have gone above and beyond my expectations. You know, I thought it'd be good to have a few let the community know that we were here to support them, but for you to continue doing the work that you're doing um, in uniting and bringing our communities together, but also showcasing the things that our police department are doing. Uh, again, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. So I, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Jimmy for his work. And I wanna thank all of your, um, your officers who've participated in. I think that the community appreciates it because I, I do talk to several of them about those after those meetings and they appreciate the efforts that you guys have made and continue to do so. Uh, thank you. And I thank you on behalf of our folks here at the department. Thank you. All right, moving on to fire. Okay. Uh, Chief Jim Wyatt, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jimmy, and uh, uh, good evening to Honorable Mayor and, and Council members. I'd like to go over the uh, Fire Department's uh, work plan with you. And uh, the first item that we have that's at the top of our list is the uh, uh, development and implementation of the Santa Teresa Temporary Slash Permanent Fire Station. Um, I'll just say that uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, time period for us, uh, as, as with everyone else, uh, as, as if it weren't enough to have uh, COVID and the pandemic, uh, we have seen a significant increase in our fire um, calls as well as our EMS calls. Uh, just uh, this past year alone, we've, uh, we've broken over 6,100 calls. And uh, of those, about 20% were fires, um, we're up by 20% on fires and about 12% on EMS calls. Along with that, uh, we're seeing a pretty robust beginning of this year. And uh, uh, by projections, we should exceed uh, 6,500 calls again. This all co comes to uh, a point where um, we are uh, definitely in need of a fourth fire station and the um, Santa Teresa uh, unit that we've that we've had deployed uh, since uh, 2019 has been a significant help to us. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how many times uh, where I've personally have run calls uh, where there's been uh, uh, large incidents and then having the uh, the ability to have uh, four uh, companies to draw from rather than just three uh, has been a huge relief for us. There's been multiple times where we've had um, uh, several calls for service at the same time and been completely depleted even after our, our fourth, uh, fourth station was deployed. So we, it comes at a very good time. Um, right now we're looking at uh, a couple of possibilities and we'll, make, we'll be making a formal recommendation, but we're still doing some more research, research on it. And that's the um, uh, either doing a temporary a uh, fire station using a trailer um, with uh, electrical hookups and a pad uh, at the actual Glen Lomas uh, fire station site, or um, doing uh, remodel uh, of the Teak building to accommodate um, our firefighters um, in a 24 hour uh, type of station. Um, both items will be um, uh, cost items and certainly we'll, uh, we're looking at those, um, I'm just, just a rough estimate. We're looking at about a hundred thousand for the uh, uh, for the um, fire station trailer pad, and about uh, another twenty five to three thousand dollars a month to uh, to lease the trailer, versus the uh, the teak building, which would uh, at a minimum cost us about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to make it uh, usable and livable for a twenty four hour period. So um, all of that comes is coming along with uh, the staffing too. And um, uh, so we'll, like I said, we'll, we are, we're developing the plan to uh, present to uh, Jimmy and the council and uh, with, our, with our full recommendation on the next steps. 
Um, the next item is our uh, type one fire engine, and that's the uh, building of it and deployment. As you recall, um, uh, council approved the, um, the financing and uh, the monies for the uh, uh, Rosenbauer um, fire, type one fire engine. It's, uh, it's moving forward. And at this point, we need to, um, uh, to monitor its build to make sure it's, it meets our specifications. Uh, along with that, we have to uh, uh, earmark where it's going to go uh, and replace. We've already determined that it's going to replace the busiest engine in, in the city, and that's our uh, Los Animas station engine. And um, the next item uh, is our uh, development of specifications and purchase of additional fire equipment. And right now, we, um, we've identified that we have a need for two more type one fire engines over the next um, three years. Uh, the first one uh, will be replacing our engine 49, our Sunrise engine. And this, uh, the second type one engine uh, that would be built uh, in the future uh, would be the, uh, the new Santa Teresa fire station uh, engine. It, it's, a, it's a type one and will certainly um, meet the uh, specifications for that, that uh, area that it serves. And then we have one more engine, if that's not enough. Um, it's a part of our aging fleet. And um, you've heard us talk about that before, but I'll just say it again, that um, we have uh, extended out as much or as long as we can the, uh, the current uh, uh, apparatus or fleet that we have out there. And our type three, which is a wildland engine has been used extensively uh, both uh, within the city and uh, and in neighboring uh, communities to assist with uh, uh, their wildfires as well. Uh, case in point is uh, last year, uh, we were the first in on the um, crew fire and um, that resulted in 5,000 acres being burned, but we were able to save um, uh, several homes that were in the pathway of that fire. And part of that was the use of the, uh, of the type three engine, but that's gonna be due for replacement uh, in the next uh, uh, two to three years. So we're, uh, that's another engine that we have to, uh, to budget for and, uh, and get specifications for. Um, onto the next page, we've got the, uh, uh, we have to identify funding for the Chestnut and Los Animas station retrofit plan. Uh, this is a uh, uh, somewhat of a large lift and, cer and certainly unfunded um, liability for us. We're looking at an estimated uh, $3.5 million to um, devote to both the uh, Chestnut, our headquarters station, and the Los Animas station for uh, seismic retrofit, as well as uh, remodel. Um, there are other costs associated with it that um, we can look at, such as complete replacement of Los Animas and uh, and the uh, Chestnut Station, but we haven't got there yet. Uh, we have some preliminary estimates that show that um, probably in the neighborhood of about 10 million for the Chestnut Station and about 8.5 million uh, for the Los Animas Station if we were gonna go down that route. So we'll be providing again uh, recommendations to you, but uh, uh, both stations were uh, built in the 1970s and uh, they are in uh, definite, definite need of some uh, uh, significant uh, repair and, um, and uh, remodel, particularly for privacy needs and also safety needs uh, in light of the last uh, of the current pandemic we, we find ourselves in to isolate our fi firefighters better. Uh, the next item down is the uh, uh, development and, and implement of, of the over the air mapping. This is actually uh, uh, brings us into the 21st century where we utilize um, uh, a particular type of uh, mapping system that helps bring up in layers our, uh, our uh, fire, uh, fire response area, both in the city and outside of our own city. It would um, provide uh, a number of um, uh, benefits to us. It provides for structural pre-planning as well as wildland pre-planning, -pre -pre uh, provides for evacuation uh, planning, for uh, disasters, and we saw that with the um, 
with the uh, uh, large SEU fire uh, where um, segments of our neighboring um, uh, rural community had to be evacuated. And that was uh, all uh, using that same over the map, over the air mapping that, uh, that we're seeking. Um, also large event pre preparation and planning as well as uh, automated vehicle locator and uh, unit status. We have pieces of this, but uh, this um, new mapping system helps uh, bring together both our CAD and our uh, AVL so that we can uh, uh, modernize our, uh, our responses. And then uh, last but not least is the ability to, at a glance, uh, see the resource strength as, it, uh, as we call in for uh, mutual aid. So uh, again, a very exciting uh, development and we're still in the process of reviewing this. Uh, Santa Clara uh, County Fire Department has already implemented it. They've done a, a great job in spearheading this and uh, we hope to, uh, to follow um, in the not too distant future. And then um, last on my list is to improve our uh, record management system, incident data reporting. That doesn't sound very exciting, but I'll just say that um, uh, for data collection and analyzing that for all sorts of um, uh, programs and projects we're looking at, this would this has been um, a tremendous lift for us, but uh, we've, we've recently implemented it. Now we have to um, finalize how we're going to use the, uh, um, uh, the information and identify uh, key components of that. This will provide us uh, real-time disease monitoring. This is really important, certainly in the next pandemic, but certainly uh, disease outbreaks. We'll be able to isolate communities that uh, uh, where we can actually map out where uh, the disease is uh, formulating. In addition to that, we'll provide um, uh, uh, trauma and medical data collection and analysis. So we'll be able to determine those areas of the city that um, uh, can be better served using uh, different sorts of resources other than ground ambulances, such as uh, helicopters. And then um, homeless emergencies, uh, that's been a uh, uh, certainly a, a topic of discussion and uh, we're, we're analyzing what sort of emergencies we're uh, responding to as our homeless population continues to increase. And then also uh, it goes um, partly hand in hand since half of our behavioral health uh, issues are uh, related to the homeless and will provide better uh, data and analysis of um, behavioral health emergencies as well and uh, better allocation of our resources. And I'm ready to take any questions you might have. I don't see any hands raised, but I can't see everyone. Are we good? Okay. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time and um, and your uh, the opportunity to tell you what we're doing. Thank you. All right, Adam, huh? Okay. All right, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Member. My name is Adam Hennig, Recreation Manager, and I'll be speaking to you about recreation's proposed work plan. Um, in addition to the Recreation Division's day-to-day -day operations, uh, we have set out the following goals in the next few years. Um, in partnership with Santa Clara County and First Five California, the city is collaborating with these two agencies to implement a family resource center at San Ysidro Cultural Center. There is currently an RFQ selection committee that is interviewing potential organizations to serve as a service provider. We're hoping to launch the center this summer through a phased approach. Uh, the next item is uh, to translate the entire guide in Spanish. So currently we only translate a portion of it, uh, but starting in with the 2022 winter activity guide, we will translate the entire activity guide. So it'll be both in English and Spanish, which will increase recreation's ability to reach more residents than ever before. Uh, this summer recreation staff will be looking into developing an RFP to uh, contract for an independent pool operator to manage at Christopher High School Aquatic Center with the goal that it would take effect next summer, 2022. 
the city would provide access to a safe facility while the operator would manage the day-to-day -day operations that include hiring lifeguards, offering swim lessons, aquatic classes, and providing janitorial support. Uh, to meet Gilroy's growing population's recreation needs, we expect to increase program participation enrollment by 15% uh, each year for the next two years. In addition, uh, the division plans to recruit at least five new recreation uh, contract instructors annually. And lastly, as, as recommended in the recreation and facility needs assessment, a quick and cost-effective solution to addressing a lack of facility space dedicated to recreation programs is to explore the possibility of transforming the senior center into a multi-generational community center with expanded services for all ages. It would have minimal disruption of senior services yet provide more opportunities to better utilize the center's existing space for classes and community meetings. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, I see. Okay, I see Council Member Armendaris and Council Member Hilton. I don't know in which order. And Sorry, Council Rebecca. Okay. Yeah. And Council so, Member Tom. Um, why are we looking at um, contracting out the services at Christopher High School? Well, as a result of the, the budget cuts, um, you know, we have, uh, the, the city has allocated one and a half million dollars and has listed all of the services that it wanted to provide with those one and a half million dollars. And aquatics was not one of those services. Um, so it doesn't recover all of its costs when you, when you try to run an entire um, aquatic center. And so this way, this way too, the city will probably, if it's able to locate a contractor, it'll probably be able to provide a lot more services than the city could. This way reaching more families, more youth and teaching them how to, um, um, you know, obviously to swim and so forth. Um, but is there a cost savings? Because I've, I've, I've seen that contracting out doesn't always um, result in cost savings, right? And then we lose good city jobs. Yes. So, so what we're doing is we're just going to explore the possibility. We, we haven't even jumped into it yet. So the first thing we need to do is really look into crunching the numbers. What, what are, do the benefits outweigh the negatives for this? If in fact they want to look into uh, an RFP process. And even if we do move forward with the RFP process, the, the, con the operator that, if there is an operator that we, we find, whether or not they'll meet our needs. And so there's a, there's a number of steps along the way uh, in order to ensure that, that it works out for the city. Okay, thank you, Adam. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw in just on that, that we, as Adam knows, um, this was a subject, swimming in particular, where the city was just not able to recover the, the costs. I mean, our, our charter says 60% is supposed to be our target cost recovery for swimming. And we could the best we could do was 28%. Could another something do better than that is what we're trying to consider and still make it available to more people. So I know I'm not supposed to be saying too much on this, I know, but there are reasons for that. And I am very grateful that that's on the list, even though it's discretionary and who knows when, you know, when we'll get to it. Okay, Council Member Hilton. Thank you. Hey, Adam, um, that Family Resource Center at St. Nucidro Cultural Center, building that out, will that also look into if there's um, if there is a parking need like um, to expand somewhere, vacant lots, um, how people will end up at St. Lucidro and that draw, um, it, will that be a part of that discussion at all? Well, in terms of the Family Resource Center, no, it's just focused on selecting an operator to run the center throughout the day, throughout the year. Um, but, but parking has not been brought up in relationship to San Ysidro, unless another city staff member wants to, to comment on that. I, th okay. I think that's accurate. Yeah, I mean, I just, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, the only thing that is being evaluated now is programming. There's no dollars set aside to expand parking facilities or anything like that at San Ysidro. Okay, yeah, I was just bringing it up. It just, I know we're building out a lot of services there and they've been hosting a lot of events there. 
um, and we're continuing to grow. I just didn't know if that was a growing concern from that community at all. Thank you. All right, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Adam, thank you again. Um, and you know, I appreciate the work that you've done and it's great to see you when I'm out in my, most of my daily runs, I'll see you out there. So it's good <laughs> to see you out there biking. Hey, um, in regards, this is something that I've you know, been bringing up for almost four years. And I know our previous city manager um, had made discussions with him and I know um, Jimmy as well. But when we're talking about expanding more services, um, you know, doing more things for, especially for our kids in Gilroy, you know, and obviously for, for adults and maybe those that, um, you know, can't go to a gym because it's too expensive, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I, I don't know where we're at or, you know, what I'm more likely, I would like to see us continuing working with the YMCA, you know, because again, they provide a lot of services and I know, and I've been pushing this or fighting for this for years is they and I haven't had a discussion with them in a while, but I know they were very interested in regards to the senior center and seeing how, or they could work or, you know, work together in partnership with us. And, um, you know, it would be good to know where we are with those discussions. Uh, if we're gonna, you know, bring them to the table and see how we can utilize their services or, you know, again, um, to bring more activities for, for the residents of Gilroy. So I don't know if you have any updates, if you can give it to me now, or we can have that at a later time, but. We would like to make sure that we bring them in any other agency or um, community organization that might be beneficial to our, our residents. Uh, yeah, and actually, you know what? I, I see the, the executive director, Andrea Nicolette, almost every week now um, at, at the senior center for the vaccination clinic. Um, so, so obviously, we've been continuously to provide the nutritional lunch program. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've had side conversations about expanding programming with the Y, but you know, as you're probably aware too, we have a lot of other uh, partners that we also work with uh, from ARP uh, to SourceWise, you know, to the county um, and, and now with the Family Resource Center. Um, so we're always looking for, for partners to expand our recreation services. It's one of the reasons why too, uh, we put down as one of our objective is to increase the number of independent contract instructors who are able to provide uh, a diversified set of activities so we can reach all ages, all interests. Right, no, thank you for that. Um, in, in, Follow-up question, in regards to, um, <sighs> I'm trying to think of, it's, it's at the tip of my tongue, the, the old hospital here on Fifth Street. Wheeler. Wheeler, I, that's, I was gonna say Wheeler, so. Um, <laughs> You know, and I know that that was one of the discussions of a year or so ago that I had with the YMCA and um, seeing how they can contract out and, you know, rent some spaces or whatever it may be to help, you know, generate some revenue to the city. Um, but I, I think the issue that I kept hearing is there wasn't any transparency in regards to what was available, what was not available from the city. And so it was, it was a frustrating process. So I'm not sure if those discussions are happening or if they've had hap if they're happening at all or if we reached out to them to see if there's interest in them sort of renting space out or any other agency or organization to utilize um, whichever available spaces but also to generate some income to the city you know i'm not familiar with the discussions with wheeler um you know, uh, on, on Fifth Street, you're talking about the senior center or right. the senior residents over there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar that there had been previous discussions, but I certainly can look into it. Yeah, what I would what I would ask you do, and I haven't had a chance to talk to her in a while, but I would ask that you ask Miss um, Nicolette and talk to her and sort of get an update on that and see if we can bring that discussion back up. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Adam. Okay, next up, we have the finance department. All right. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'm Cindy Murphy, and I'm the interim finance director for Gilroy. And I have three work plan items that I'd like to highlight today um, for finance. So the first one you're very familiar with is our enterprise resource planning implementation, our ERP. This has been an active 
work plan item for well over a year. Um, we're kind of in the final stretch with this. Our, we were intending to go live July 1st, as many of you know. Um, we received word from Tyler Muniz, our consultant last week, that our implementation consultant has resigned from the project. And unfortunately, we only have her for another week. Because so many municipalities go live July 1st, we're gonna be a little bit delayed. So we're anticipating um, based on a call with them today that it will probably be a one to two month delay. It shouldn't impact us too significantly though because we're ready to go and basically we're, we should have a smooth transition when we pull in data from our existing system. So that will be the general ledger implementation. And then over the next several months, we'll continue to roll out um, various parts of the project. For example, the budgeting part, utility billing, payroll, and some of the other modules. So we'll be working on this for at least the next six months to a year um, with the first portion going live this summer. The second item is um, an update to our fees and charges for the city. Our last official uh, fee schedule was updated in 2014 by council. This project was started last year. We were um, well on our way to doing updates and then with COVID hitting, everything got put on hold. So as you're aware, our new finance director, Harjot Singha is starting this uh, Thursday. And so one of the things I'll be working on is some special projects. And this is one of those special projects that I've been asked to stay on and um, see this through and get this finished. So that, that will be one of the next projects I'll be working on. And then the last item we're highlighting here um, are funding options for pension costs. We have several options we could employ. Um, we could look at pension obligation bonds. We can look at lease revenue bonds. Um, we can, and we have established a section 115 trust, but we might decide to put additional monies into that. We can find other ways to have additional discretionary payments made to it. And then there's also a policy or a program with CalPERS called a fresh start. And we can look at that option as well, or we could do any combination of these things. So again, this is a project um, that I'll be working on with our new finance director, Harjot. He has some great ideas and some good experience in working with these. So we'll take a look at what options we have and come back to council with options. And um, we can talk through those and then figure out how we wanna address our pension, obligate, or our, uh, pension costs for the future. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I see Council Member Tovar's hand raised. Sorry, Mayor, no. I forgot to put my hand Okay. Yeah. All right. Not to make you feel left out, Cindy, I'd have a bunch of questions, but I know I don't need to ask them right now. So it's okay. <laughs> Finances, yeah, <laughs> it's a fun department. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Of course. All right. Moving from one fun apartment department to an equally fun department is Leanne with Admin Services. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, Leanne McPhillips, Administrative Services Director. So the Administrative Services Department is one of those departments that kind of operates behind the scenes. We're primarily an internal service group that consists of facilities, fleet, human resources and risk management, and information technology. So each division of the department has um, a very busy core set of functions to be performed in support of the city organization, whether it be buildings, vehicles, people, claims, or computers, there's a lot of moving parts and services being provided by a small team of employees. The items noted in the work plan are those projects and assignments that are beyond the regular day-to-day -day work of the administrative services team and what we believe can be accomplished in fiscal year 22 and 23 with our current staffing complement. The work plan um, items are those of the highest priority that are mandated and core to our work and not discretionary. So a few of the items on our list have already been touched on by departments uh, because we work very cooperatively with um, other departments to complete certain key projects. Um, so for example, in facilities, starting with that group, if funded, we want to replace the City Hall HVAC system. This is a, a significant undertaking. It was mentioned by Public Works as they went over some of the capital projects that are not funded. Um, this is one of the top priority items because of the condition of the current HVAC system at City Hall. I, I, I 
joke with, I, I really, I mean, it's kind of a joke, but it's not really a joke that uh, our facilities team are, are a team of MacGyvers that have jerry-rigged with, with uh, wires and pipe cleaners and rubber bands and all different kinds of things to keep the HVAC system in this building operational. It is so outdated, we can't even buy parts for it anymore. And so we're having to make shift our own parts to keep the system running. So I emphasize that to you because it is such a significant and important project, but it needs a lot of money to fund. And we know that that's an, a, you know, a definite challenge right now. Uh, we're, we're planning to remove the arbor at Wheeler due to some safety issues. Uh, we have some ongoing environmental remediation um, um, items that need to be completed at our shooting range um, with, with lead and water and groundwater contamination, et cetera. So there's some changes we have to make in addition to just removing the lead from the shooting range. Um, we're overseeing some solar install on city facilities. So we're moving in the direction of, of some green projects and um, our facility superintendent will be overseeing the install as it relates to city facilities. And then we're doing some safety upgrades for electrical panels at the corporation yard. Um, and it's also just important to note with respect to the facilities that our, our city facilities are aging. You've heard that from us before. It's been difficult to maintain and update facilities with our limited funding and staffing level over the last 10 years. And while we uh, work hard to address the most critical issues and items that are related to safety, um, city facilities start to show their wear and tear if we don't keep them upgraded um, and it ultimately can shorten the lifespan of the facility. It's much like your home or any building you might need to maintain or even like a car. If you complete the ongoing preventative maintenance on schedule, the vehicle will last longer. So we face some challenges as it relates to facilities. And you've heard about some of those projects tonight um, that are not funded. Um, and so, you know, there are things like the Chestnut and Los Animas fire stations that need attention. Um, resurfacing of the city-owned parking lots, the uh, resurfacing of the activity pool at Christopher High School needs to be done. Uh, we need to replace the chiller at the City Hall Annex. We need a new water tank at the Gilbert Golf Course. These are all challenging projects that don't currently have a funding source. And we wanted to you know, just bring those to your attention again uh, because they are things that we definitely need to do at some point. Um, otherwise, you know, you know, other things may occur and, and the repair may end up costing us more money in the long term. In the area of fleet, um, uh, a, a small team that maintains 436 assets, 143 of which are public safety vehicles. We are refilling two of three full-time fleet positions through two of three full-time fleet positions, can I say that, got tongue-tied there, um, training and orienting. That's, that's two-thirds of the department. Um, and we've had some retirements there and we're uh, bringing on folks to uh, uh, replace those, those positions. In fact, our new equipment mechanics started this morning. Uh, we are assisting the fire department with the monitoring of the uh, uh, build of the Rosenbauer Type 1 fire engine. Um, that will be an ongoing uh, project over this next year in cooperation with the fire department. Um, and then again, working with the fire department to purchase additional frontline equipment that uh, Chief Wyatt talked to you about earlier. We also plan to purchase and deploy 12 new vehicles, six for public safety and, and six for non-public safety departments that are just a part of our fleet that need to be replaced. Next slide. In the area of human resources and risk management, our top priority, uh, as was just mentioned by our finance director, Cindy Murphy, is the ERP project and the human capital man management module is the module that uh, encompasses um, all of our human resources information and data for employees and payroll. And so that module kickoff starts on April 6th and we'll be working on that, uh, uh, dedicated working on that for the next year. Um, and so there is time set aside every month over this next year to complete the implementation of that module. Um, we continue to work on our COVID-19 response and we're starting to make plans for our next phase, which is the reopening of City Hall and the return of all of our employees to uh, working uh, at least some of the time on site um, so that we can service our customers. So we are starting that process as we 
have moved into the orange tier and hopefully the yellow tier soon, um, we will want to reopen our city offices as soon as it's safe to do so. We have several labor contract negotiations that are planned over the next two year period. Uh, we're getting ready to start the negotiation process with our AFSME labor group. And then we will have the fire and GMA labor groups in the following year. And then we have an undertaking that we complete with respect to open enrollment and our employee health and wellness. Um, those are efforts that, that we have to continue forward with and are um, a significant workload that we complete each year. We have a general liability risk assessment process that we'll be going through in this next year. We're planning customer service training for employees and continuing our efforts with employee ergonomics to ensure that our workspaces are set up in a safe uh, way uh, to uh, avoid any injuries with respect to our employees. In the area of information technology, um, this is a small team that is overseeing 100 physical and virtual servers, 15 different locations, and 400 network connected devices. Um, so in addition to keeping all that up and running, um, they are assisting us with the ERP and LMS implementations. Um, they have a citywide desktop replacement uh, project currently underway that will be finished. Um, we are working on our cybersecurity assessment plan and implementation. Um, we are already part way, part, way, part way underway with respect to that, but that will be a continued effort over the next two years. The police chief mentioned the uh, records management system replacement that's in partnership with IT. Uh, we currently have a project started that we'll be uh, seeing through in the next uh, few months with our audio visual moder modernization in the council chambers. We need to replace all of our multifunction machines that are throughout our city facilities. These are the copier, scanner, fax machines that, that you might have seen as you've come through city facilities. Um, these get a lot of use and periodically need to be replaced. And then we have some Wi-Fi replacement uh, uh, as a project that we will be completing in the next two years. So there's a lot going on and happy to answer any questions. All right, does anyone have questions that I maybe can't, I can't see everybody in my screen again, so shout out. Leanne, for, okay, Fred. Fred. Oh, going back to um, your, your slides. Well, in regards to, you, you mentioned, because I think we've all been pushing and advocating and, and hoping uh, in regards to customer service. Uh, you mentioned customer service training. So is this a continuing type of training? Is it a one-time workshop um, or is it continuous training for all employees, new employees? Um, and what, what costs are we, are we looking at here? So yes to all of that. It's okay. both uh, training for all of our new hires, as well as ongoing training for our existing employees. This is one of those trainings that you periodically want to revisit with your workforce to, uh, you know, re-emphasize those things that are important. Um, we are, are actually contemplating some uh, a combination of some um, outside trainers, as well as um, trainers within our own city workforce. We have some excellent employees who really truly know what it means to provide awesome customer service. And from our management team, we have done some brainstorming of what it might look like to deliver this training. And your very own city administrator, Jimmy Forbes, is very focused on this and has made it a personal statement to all of us that he plans to be a, a big part of delivering customer service training uh, to employees. So they hear it straight from the top of the organization, what is expected of our employees as it relates to providing um, excellent customer service. So I think it's gonna be a combination of things to achieve the objective. But no, and that's great to hear um, because again, I think the important thing here is, like you say, continuing to train and educate and teach um, folks what it's what what great customer service means to the city. Mm -hmm. But it also, I think where we have to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, where if I and I agree with you, one hundred ten percent, one hundred fifty percent, we have some great employees, and I've all my interactions have been wonderful, but. You know, if if for some reason there are complaints um, for an employer, whomever, what do we have in place to make sure that it's, um, you know, that we stop it right then and there and make sure that it's corrected. I mean, I think that's important as well. It's just not the training, but the sort of 
accountability and the follow through as well. Yep. Yeah. Thank We're you. on it. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Hilton. Thank you. Hey, Leanne. Um, well, some of those um, over here, <laughs> it's hard to tell. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, um, well, a portion of those non-public safety uh, fleet vehicles, are one of those going to be the sewer vector truck or anything for the public works um, specific side? Will those recommendations come for us? So um, they, there are a, a few vehicles related to public works. Um, we have not received um, any kind of written justification just yet for uh, adding a new Vactor truck, but we anticipate uh, that staff from public works uh, may be providing that to us uh, for further evaluation and inclusion in the 22-23 uh, budget. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Uh and then last but not least is the administration area, which is communication and engagement, uh, which is Rochelle Bedell followed by uh, Maria De Leon. And then I will finish you up and, uh, and uh, have any, answer any outstanding questions you have before we, uh, we complete our, our study sessions. So uh, go ahead, Rochelle. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, good to be with you tonight. Um, we're going to start off with um, five items on the Communication Engagement Work Plan, um, and these items are tailored to help build a more robust communication engagement, um, as we've been doing over the last few years. So starting off, we're going to be developing a social media policy um, that will be followed by the development of a city logo policy. Um, and then we'll be looking at enhancing the current social media strategy, just looking at how we're using social media, how we can um, do it in a, in a better way that, that benefits our community um, more broadly than what we're currently doing. Um, we're also going to be looking at developing an earned media strategy. This hopefully will be in conjunction with um, economic development, um, looking at how we can place articles um, in the media without paying for them. So really working with the media to develop topics that they're interested in writing about um, that show the best things going on in our city. And then lastly, we'll be looking at developing a process for film permits. This is a piece that comes to us once or twice a year. And at this point, we don't have a process. So um, just developing that process so that we have a set system and, and we know what to do when, when those requests come in. And that concludes my work plan. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have their hand raised? Uh, Council Member Tovar. All right. <laughs> hey, so earlier I said we're about to ask my questions. You said you say that all the time. Now I have a I know, but no, I know. Okay. I know. We're trying to get through all this. All right. I, I know. I understand it. I'll be brief. We're still, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and appreciate you joining myself and the fire chief um, on this project that we're working on. One of the things that I, you know, when talking again, I looked at our website and we've done a tremendous job in updating it, you know, but I think it's important that when we look at it, um, that we make sure that residents that may not speak English or read English is, is, is incorporated in there, you know, where maybe we put some Spanish easier for the Spanish speaking community to read our website and locate things. You know, one of the things obviously is COVID testing and um, resources and you know you have to scroll all the way to the very bottom to find that and it's in English. I understand when you clicked on it you'll be able to you know um, click on another button that would be in Spanish but I think we need to make sure that we're reaching all segments of our community on our website so it's, it's the information is there and I love the social media um, outreach but I think you know our home base meaning our website should be um, a vehicle that people can go to and easily, you know, find information on there, not have to search for it and not know if it's in English or Spanish. So I ask that again, that we're, we're, um, you know, we keep that in mind when we're, when we're working on projects that we're reaching all segments of our community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jimmy next. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Maria de Leon who is uh, really, uh, I, I wanna remind you that when we, we created this position, it was to uh, take care of our vulnerable populations and housing in that area, but little did we know that our vulnerable population would be COVID-19 impacted. And uh, certainly the unhoused has been something uh, that has really uh, come to the forefront. So that's what Maria's really been working on. And uh, so uh, she's gonna talk to you tonight about the ad hoc committee and, and some of the things that she's working on. 
Good evening, my name is Maria de Leon. I'm program administrator and I also provide staff support to the Homeless Ad Hoc Committee. So on September 8, 2020, a study session was held on homelessness where staff presented um, a report that identified the issues and challenges faced by the city and the community. So at this meeting, at this study session, council supported the creation of an ad hoc committee and appointed council members Marks, Rocco and Tovar to begin the discussion on the city's next steps in addressing homelessness. So the homeless ad hoc committee members wanted to get a better understanding of homeless so they could, so they held a series of sessions. So these meetings were with folks who were stakeholders who were greatly impacted by homelessness. So this included homeowners, businesses, agency providers, county representative, homeless advocates, churches, and homeless individuals to, so that the homeless ad hoc committee could get a better understanding of this complicated matter. So although the city of Gilroy cannot solve this alone, it wants to be a part of the solution by taking steps with various partners, both small and large in addressing homelessness. So this includes staff working alongside our residents and our volunteers and our businesses, service organizations and uh, agency providers, county and state agencies and other jurisdictions. So currently the Homeless Ad Hoc Committee uh, members are still gathering information, they're still meeting, but shortly uh, they will be recommending solutions to include potential pilot projects and programs for city council funding and consideration. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Council members, I cannot see you all. Does someone have a hand raised? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Oh, I see a hand raised now. Council member Armendaris. Yeah, I'd just like to go back to the slide if we could. Okay, thank you. Do you have a question? No, I just wanted to double check something that I read. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Then, Jamie, I'm gonna wait for you to get to a point where I can go to public comment before, I'd like to do that before going back to the council. Okay, uh, Madam Mayor, I have my office. You have your own. Which be pretty quick, and then that'll be the time, and uh, I'll give you the next steps, and mine will take All just right. a minute. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I just have one slide here to talk to you about uh, the things that are kind of projects and things in, in my in my office, and uh, one is the creation of the Gourmet Alley Stakeholder Working Group. Uh, I will let council know that I don't want to do that until we're done with the uh, homeless ad hoc committee group. Uh, I want to pace myself on uh, the committees and projects. So as soon as that one stops, I'm happy to jump into the next one. Um, we have not been able to hire an economic development manager. I'm not giving up. Uh, we need it. Uh, I need the help. And so we're going to be looking at some different ways. We've uh, swung and missed a few times. Uh, complete the Emergency Operations Center operations plan that has uh, been started to be updated now that we have a half-time EOC coordinator on board. That is their, their job and their role, and we'll be able to get that done now, now that we have that, that plan. Uh, create a grants program. Uh, I've heard you loud and clear on that, so uh, no need to elaborate on that. And then continuing to pursue opportunities for the sports park and the 536 acres at Hecker Pass. That'll, that'll take up a, a lot of the project time in, in my office. And then continue the downtown facade program, which we started last year and are now in the second year of doing some facade grants and improvements in downtown. So that, that's the kind of projects that I'm working on out of my office and, and you know whatever comes up during the year. Uh, but should be no surprises here. These are all things you've talked about. So um, uh, I believe there's a question and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay. Yes. Council member Armandaris. Is there room to explore a, um, like a housing czar, like somebody who would, uh, be in charge of, um, looking at housing of directing this, um, you know, staff on inclusionary housing and upholding our, our promotion of affordable housing? 
I, I think, yes, there is. And there's, uh, you know, there's 100 different ways to do that. And I will have something in the city's city administrator's recommended budget uh, to address that question. I'm not ready to, uh, to give you the surprise yet, but um, it is coming. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't mean to ruin it, but thank you. No. <laughs> you yeah. ruined it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, didn't ruin it. I appreciate the setup. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, I will go through the next steps and I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Uh, this is the end of kind of the theory and philosophical work for council. Next time you see us, we'll be bringing budget numbers with you. And um, everything you've seen tonight will be um, have resources assigned to it. You may not think it's enough. You may think it's too much, but that's what we're going to need to talk about next. So uh, we will take the next month uh, aligning our budget and finances to what we presented to you tonight. And we'll have another budget workshop where we, like I said, we will start talking about the money. So um, feel free at any time to let me know if you have other questions or something you see or, or you, you want us to address, but we're not done. Yeah, we haven't made any decisions yet and we still got time to, to address some things. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor to uh, take you to the next. Uh, next All right. Step. Thank you. Yes, I would like to go to public comment. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if there is anybody waiting, but if there is, um, this is the time. Uh, we currently have one hand raised, and I will say if you'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine now or raise your hand via the application. The next speaker is going to be Stephen Hayes. I am hitting allowed to talk. You may unmute yourself now, Stephen. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. This is Stephen Hayes, local president for 2805 Gilroy Firefighters Association. Last meeting, I called in about the Heartland emergency response and the fire district's inability to cover due to the road closure. I need to stress the point that it's a call volume problem more than anything. And since the standards of coverage was completed in 2019, as Chief Wyatt stated, we've had an increase in calls every year, and the district has as well. Um, Gilroy Fire Department's you know, inability at times to cover our own emergency calls has made us an unreliable resource for the district. There's been multiple in instances where we've not been able to fill a resource request for the fire district due to call volume in our city at that given time. Uh, we urge the council to work towards the completion of the Santa Teresa fire station and staff it, bringing us closer to the standards of coverage studies recommendation to increase our minimum daily staffing. Thank you for your attention to this matter. I yield the remaining time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mayor, may, may I ask a question? You have a question, council member? Okay. Well, well yeah, no, this I, is, hang, just a second. You mean if the caller? Well, no, it's not directed to the call, it's directed to our <laughs> Okay, can we wait? We're in public comment. Can I see if there are any, is, yeah. Uh, Suzanne, are there any other speakers? If you'd like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone now or raise your hand. It appears we have no additional public speakers. Okay, Council Member Tovar, you were saying. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jimmy, in regards to Mr. Hayes's questions and concerns. I know it's second time he's brought this up. Um, can we have a follow through on sort of what he's discussing and um, get an update on that? I, I believe we could, but I also believe that the things that he's brought up are best addressed through his chain of command and management. So um, if that's, yes, agreed. You know, uh, if, if we, you know, I, I, and if, and if that's not the case, if that's failing, then that would surprise me. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little taken aback that this is the form that we've decided to communicate our issues with. Okay. All right. Yeah, there is a chain of command and that's how it should be, should be followed. As for his comments about the fire station, I think all of us know we are on it. We're, we're on that. So, yeah. So if that, that, that's something we are doing our best with. All right. So, are there is there any other items? Because otherwise, we are going to be going into closed session. All right. So then, with that, I never get this right, but um, we need a motion. Pu uh, is there a public comment? Well, let me. Uh, if, if, Thank if you, I'm Andy. Here. Please. Yes, I think <laughs> um, first, let me announce the agenda item. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is a conference. Uh, this would would this is a closed session for a conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation 
pursuant to paragraph uh, one of subdivision D of the government code section 54956.9 and Gilroy city code section 17A113A. The case is the law foundation of Silicon Valley versus city of Gilroy Superior Court County of Santa Clara case number 20 CV362347 filed January 22nd, 2020. So the first thing to do is to take public comment, if any, on the closed session. If you would like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone now or raise your hand in the application. We have no public comment. All right, in that case, it is my legal opinion to the council that, discuss, that we should go into closed session because discussion of this matter in open session would likely and unavoidably prejudice the position of the city of Gilroy. So in order to go into closed session based on that legal advice, we need a vote of the council at this point. All right. I'll, I'll make a motion to go into closed session. Thank you, Peter. Second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Into closed session we go. Okay, so that is a unanimous vote. That is, for the record, that was a unanimous vote to go into closed session, correct? Thank you, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna start working to get people out of here and end the Facebook Live.